Good evening, everyone. You're going to have to carry me through this whole series, okay? Because uh, I don't have a voice anymore, and it goes into spasm, and uh, I don't know who to blame, but that's, that's how it is. So I'm going to not talk very loud un unless something happens. Then, then we'll see what we can do. Uh, did they want to perhaps give me the headset and I can move around? I'm, I'm a mover. You haven't noticed that, have you? <laughs> the screen. How do we get that on? Thank you. Like this. Okay, let me put this on. That's on. Absolutely. Yeah. Got signal. Okay. Does it look funny? <laughs> okay, we won't get anywhere without prayer, so let's open with prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, we are living in such troublous times, and there are so many things happening around us, and you want us to be witnesses for your grace. And so I pray that you will grace us with your presence here tonight, Grant that everything works and that uh, there is a voice too. In Jesus' name, Amen. I just recorded a series called, let me just get this thing like that somehow, that's better. I just recorded a series called From Crete to Malta at uh, Amazing Discoveries. So, it doesn't really matter whether you record it or not because you're going to get a, it's going to go out and it's going to go on the internet and it's going to be free and it's going to be shareware because this is no time to mess around with the message. So, I don't know, what are you going to do about the recording? Just let them record or whatever. And uh, you can get it from, from AD and it'll be more complete than this one because we don't have quite as much time to do this. This series is about to tell us where we're standing in the stream of time, but also to tell us how we should be and how we should represent this message, because this message is... I'm sort of tied up in this thing. <laughs> Let me see if I can improve on that. I thought he was kind turning it up. Do I look funny with this? Who cares? There we go. Is that better? All right, I don't have to look weird on top of it. <laughs> All right, what, is, what does this mean from Crete to Malta? boo and ba a little bit and see if we can bring the sound down better. From Crete to Malta was Paul's last journey as he was traveling to Rome. And I believe this gospel ship is on its last journey traveling to Rome. And it's a very interesting story because when he left Crete, he was greatly troubled from all sides and there was a terrible storm and eventually they had to run aground on a little island called Malta and uh, well 
the ship broke apart on the island of Malta. So here he was in his little ship, and he was virtually alone, wrapped up in his message with just his companions, and all these seamen on board. And this terrible storm hit them. Luke chapter 12 verse 37 says, Blessed are those servants whom the Lord when he cometh shall find watching. Verily I say unto you that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. So what does the Lord want us to do? Watch. Watch what? We must know what to watch, right? We must watch for the signs. Now, can the signs save us? No. The only thing that can save us is a living relationship with Jesus Christ. But when you see things unfolding before your very eyes, it can certainly be an incentive to get your life in order. Isn't that so? Or, even better, an incentive to go and warn everyone out there so that the sea of glass will have to be expanded. The third watch calls for threefold earnestness to become impatient now would be to lose our earnest, persevering watching heretofore. We have to watch. We're in big, big trouble. There are so many false flags out there, but we have a compass which no one else has. And this compass is the Word of God. And I know many other people you will say have the Word of God, but the compass is missing because there are certain criteria which have to be fulfilled before the message becomes, in total, the Lord's message. So the long night of gloom is trying, but the morning is deferred in mercy because if the Master should come, so many would be found unready. God's unwillingness to have his people perish has been the reason for the long delay. I want to tell you that we are in a state of torpor. We are fast asleep. And we're listening to the news and we're listening to all kinds of stories when we have a message. We have a message, a three angels' messages that has to go to the entire world. This is no time for playing church. The shipwreck of Paul. Acts 27, 14, but not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Euroclidon. I like that word, tempestuous. It's a stormy, stormy wind. And we being exceedingly tossed with tempest, the next day they lightened the ship. And on the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. Now, who in his right mind throws out the tackling of the ship? This is what you need to sail a ship. In other words, they had to lighten the ship. This was a serious, serious situation. And they threw the tackling overboard. In other words, who is going to control the ship now? They left it to God. Because we can't control the ship. We can't. So we must... Lighten the load. Everything that is unnecessary and clings to us and weighs us down, we must now get rid of it. Because this is a serious situation. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. So, this is a crisis, and we are in this crisis at the moment. I want to ask you a question. <coughs> Excuse the frequent coughing interruption. The book of Revelation tells us who the end time players are. Am I right? The center of the book is Revelation chapter 13, 14 to 17. 
as to the end time events before we go into eschatology. Is that right? Okay. Now, who are the role players in Revelation chapter 13? There are two role players. Who are they? The beast out of the sea and the beast out of the earth. Two role players. And we should have no problem with the two role players because the reformers all recognized the first beast, at least. Every single one of them. And they identified it as Catholicism. The second beast, the reformers were waiting for it. Wesley writes just five years before 1798, the second beast is about to come because he has to arrive at the end of the 1,260 days of the first beast. The reformers knew what they were talking about. So we have to go back to those reformers. Now, do you read in Revelation chapter 13, which is followed by Revelation chapter 14, which tells us about the three angels' messages. Thank you. <laughs> Do you read anything about any other powers? Yes or no? The beast out of the sea and the beast out of the earth. Now, where is Islam, for example? Where is the Middle East turmoil in all of that? Can you see it in Revelation chapter 13? No. And that's immediately followed by Revelation chapter 14, which is the three angels' messages. Well, you can put it in there, yes, to an extent, but what we are seeing out there in the world is putting our focus in a direction where it should not be, according to Scripture. We have to watch scripture. But after a long absence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them. I find this, this terminology so interesting. After a long abstinence, is our church perhaps in a period of abstinence? Not really presenting the food necessary for the survival of our time? And he said, Sirs, if you have hearkened unto me, and not have loosed from Crete, and to have gained this harm and loss, and now I exhort you, be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life amongst you, but of the ship. Howbeit we must cast upon a certain island. We're going to hit the island. I'm telling you now, we're going to hit the island. But when the fourteenth night was come, as we were driven up and down in Adria, about midnight, the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea, they were going to get off the ship. Under color, as though they would have cast anchors out from the foreship, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. Stay in the ship. No time now to seek another ship, stay in the ship. And if you don't stay in the ship, you're going to be in trouble. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. So there goes the life support system. The tackle's gone, you can't steer the ship. The life support system is gone. And if we don't stay on the ship, even though it's going to hit an island, none of us can be saved. This is just a typology. And... Uh, you might have another interpretation. Wherefore, I pray you to take some meat. That's food. This is for your health, for there shall not a hair fall from your head of any of you. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread, and he gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. It's time we began to eat. And then they were all of good cheer. There's nothing to be afraid of as we head towards Malta. We can be of good cheer. Because this is what we've been waiting for all these years. And they also took some meat. 
And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, and look at what they did. They cast out the wheat. So the cargo of the ship was wheat. And they cast out the wheat. Now wheat is bread, bread of life. What is the ship to do before it hits Malta? Cast out the wheat. Cast out the wheat. The world has to hear. Where did they throw the wheat? Into the ocean. The waters you saw are peoples and multitudes and, pe and kingdoms and languages and the whole shooting match. Cast out the wheat. Now we're doing what we're supposed to do. And when they had taken up the anchors, they committed themselves unto the sea. Think typologically. And loosed the rubber ba rudder bands and hoist up the mainsail to the wind and made towards shore. And falling into a place where two seas meet. Isn't that interesting? They ran the ship aground and the forepart thereof stuck fast and remained unmovable. But the hinder part was broken with the violence of the waves. It's good to be in the, in the forefront. It's good to be in the forefront. Hiding in the back is not going to get you anywhere. Be in the forefront. And uh, the soldiers' counsel was, kill the prisoners. Is there going to be a death decree according to Revelation? Yes. Kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim out and escape. But the centurion, willing to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that they, which would swim, should cast themselves first into the sea and get to land. And the rest, some on boards, some on broken pieces of the ship, and so it came to pass that they escaped all safe to the land. Now what are they going to do on the land? They've cast out the wheat. They're on a collision course with Malta. And they strike Malta. The back of the ship starts breaking up. And uh, they cling to pieces of wood, debris, and they go ashore. And when they were escaped, then they knew that the island was called Melita, Malta. And the barbarous people showed us no little kindness. That's interesting. For they kindled a fire and received us, everyone, because of the present rain. This is the time for a loud cry and for the outpouring of the Spirit of God. Because of the cold, and when Paul had gathered the bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened onto his hand. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Don't think that if we bring the light crowd, the viper won't attack you. He will. But he shook him off into the fire. The people are asleep in their sins and need to be alarmed before they can shake off this lethargy. Their ministers have preached smooth things, but God's servants who bear sacred vital truth should cry loud and spare not, that the truth may tear off the garments of security and find its way into the heart. I believe we're about to strike Malta. I believe we're not going to strike ISIS. We're going to strike Malta. Not ISIS, not anything else, Malta. This is a very interesting man, Bill Clinton's favorite professor at Georgetown, Tragedy and Hope. He says, the argument of two parties should represent opposed ideas and policies in his Tragedy and Hope. And perhaps of the right and the other of the left is a foolish idea acceptable only to doctrinate and academic thinkers. Instead, two parties should be almost identical so that the American people can throw the rascals out at any election without leading to any profound or extensive shift in policy. 
and the policies that are vital and necessary for America are no longer subjects of significant disagreement, but are disputable only in details of procedure, priority, or method. So he's saying, you know, no big deal who rules this country. One of the most important things, if you want to rule and see progress, is you need dissent. You need rebellion. In this uh, book, Rulers of Evil, Sosa Tapi says, Tapi Sosa says, Saucy says, what the seal of the United States of America represents to anyone who takes it seriously is a ministry of sin. And then he quotes a Jesuit political scientist, Michael Novak, who published an article in America, which is the Jesuit magazine, and he sums it up as follows. He says, the framers, that's of the Constitution, wanted to build a novus ordo that would secure liberty and justice for all. The underlying principle of this new order is the fact of human sin. To build a republic designed for sinners, then, is the indispensable task. There's no use building a social system for saints. There are too few of them, and those there are, are impossible to live with. Any effective social system must therefore be designed for the only moral majority there is, sinners. I found that a rather fascinating statement. Now, if you cast your mind over the events of the last weeks and months, then uh, are they designing an establishment to accommodate sinners, or are they establishing one to accommodate saints? Obviously, they're going to accommodate sinners. And if you speak up against sin and unrighteousness, then you're impossible to live with. Isn't that right? You're impossible to live with. Pope calls for all religions to unite. That was in 2013. And he said, we must get together. All the religions must unite. The Orthodox, the Anglicans, the Lutherans, the Methodists, the Jews, the Muslim, the Buddha, the Buddhist, the Hindu, everybody. We must unite. And then they had the World Alliance of Religion Peace Summit in Seoul just a little over a year later, 2014. And I'm sure you've all seen this, right? Who has not seen it? Okay, I'll just describe it. They all came together to celebrate unity of religions and that all of them serve exactly the same God. The God that you see in the sun and in the rain and in the trees. That one. We are one, they said. And they celebrate it in grand style. And then at the World Alliance Peace Summit, that night they all signed that they served one and the same God. And the Hindu was there, and the Zoroastan was there, and the Baha'i was there, and the Muslim was there, and the Jew was there, and the Catholic was there, and the Anglican was there. And they all signed that they serve the same God. One and the same God. Now that's sort of weird, because Buddhism doesn't believe in a personal God at all. And when you die, nirvana, or when you reach nirvana, you become part of this, this diffuse deity which has no personality. The Jews reject Jesus Christ, as the Messiah, let alone as the Son of God. The Muslims deny Jesus as the Son of God. The Quran says, Allah has no son. And that Jesus himself will punish all those who deified him. And yet, the Roman Catholic and the Anglican can sit down and put pen to paper 
and sign that they all serve the same God. One and the same God. That's a fascinating point in history. And they did this, so-called, to achieve world peace. Because, as you can all see, the turmoil in the world comes from what? Religious turmoil. So you have all these religious factions fighting against each other, and if we were all one, and acknowledge that we have one God, well then this fighting can stop, and we can have world peace. So at the same time, as the religious leaders were signing in the one hall, so the political representatives of the nations were signing in another hall the banishment of all war. And it was called the Peace Summit, World Peace. And the Bible says, when they say, peace, peace, and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. So, what is the issue? By the way, who did not take part in the signing ceremony? The evangelicals. The evangelicals did not take part in the signing ceremony. Because there's something special planned for all evangelicals. That's the Lutherans, the Methodists, and everybody else. The Baptists, the Pentecostals. They're going to have their great day very, very soon, as we shall see. And we have to look into that typology. But in the meantime, the so that you think and act as the first beast. Because the Bible says the whole world wandered after the beast. But that's not with an A, that's with an O. Wandered is cognitive. In other words, same mindset. So there must be a mindset that is induced which will bring people to follow the beast. And his target is who? Who does he want to destroy? The true followers of Jesus Christ, who accept him as their personal savior and king and have no other king beside him. The Jews shouted, King, but Caesar. Remember that? So, But King Jesus, are they who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus? Whoever denies the Son, the same as not the Father. But he that acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Now this can be very deceptive. And we need to understand more than anyone else on this planet what the issue is. Conclusion that said between Catholicism what the key is. And well, you know, you're off the wall. You're a conspiracist. You've gone nuts. You see the enemy everywhere. When the enemy is, is sweet and kind and loving, and I have coffee with him every morning, Fundamentalist. This is dictionary.com, so take a nice modern dictionary. Fundamentalism is a form of American Protestantism that arose in the early part of the 20th century in reaction to modernism. And that stresses the infallibility of the Bible, not only in matters of faith and morals, but also as a literal historical record holding as essential to Christian faith beliefs such as the doctrine of the creation of the world, the virgin birth, physical resurrection, atonement by the sacrificial death of Christ, 